A person would receive only the amount of Shefa or divine influence or Ha'ora or divine light from the spheres that he labored and endeavored to Masakin. In other words, if he was Masakin, if he rectified or restored the spheres to a state of correction, in other words, the area that was assigned to him, he would receive enormously more shefa than if he, than if he had failed to rectify the spheres that he had been assigned to. And of course, again, he would only receive that shefa or the ha'ora from the spheres that he actually had accomplished. Nothing more and nothing less. Thus we see that the performance of Torah, mitzvahs, and Midas Teves, or Torah, the study of Torah, mitzvahs, the commandments, and good character traits, actually determine the amount of Shekhinah, or divine presence, a person could receive. Thus, Torah, mitzvahs, and Midas Teves enhance the Tikkun, or the restoration, or the rectification of the spheres, thereby promoting a greater flow of Shechina, of the Divine Presence, or Shefa, the Divine Influence, Ha'ora, the Divine Light, or the Gili Yehudoi, the revelation of the Absolute Oneness of God to that person. Thus, Torah, Mitzvahs, and Midas Teves enhanced the conductivity of the spheres concerning the Divine Flow in them, by being Masak in them. Now, when a Novi entered a prophetic state to receive a divine revelation, you should know that the amount of revelation that he actually received depended on the amount of tikkun, of correction or rectification or restoration that he had brought to the spheres assigned to him. Thus, even though a person <coughs> could be eligible and actually receive a prophetic revelation, the revelation of the Shechino, or the Divine Presence, that he actually perceived was through the very section, the very area of the spheres that he was assigned to be Masakin in the first place. <clears throat> he didn't receive these Eres, or this uh, revelation, from an area of the spheres that he was not assigned to. He received it only via the actual conduit that he actually had to restore. If he had done a superlative job in the actual tikkun, the actual rectification of the spheres, then his revelation was proportionately advanced and elevated and intensified. However, if his job, or rather if his attempts, however, was relatively deficient and lacking in terms of tikkun to his designated sphere section, then the divine revelation given him was also proportionately reduced, diminished, and curtailed. Thus we see that the actual amount of divine revelation <clears throat> depended on his actually being masakin, those spheres or that area of the spheres that were assigned to him. If he had done a good job, if he had done a great amount of Torah, Mitzvahs, and Midas Teves, then the amount of Shefa, or the greatness, or the elevation of the Divine Revelation, of course, was greatly enhanced. And if not, then the reverse was true. Now, thus we see that the performance of Torah, Mitzvahs, and Midas Teves was a prerequisite condition, not only for the attainment of the attachment phenomenon itself, but it actually determined the, the degree and quality of the divine revelation which was bestowed to the Prophet because it established the amount of tikkun to one's designated area of the spheres. So we see that the degree of attachment of spiritual beings and the shechina or the divine presence which resulted Consequently, in the realization of either Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration, or Nevoah, prophecy, was a function. In other words, this degree of attachment toward spiritual beings, or the Shrina, was a function of the degree of fulfillment of these four conditions, or four states, which I had mentioned, by the person who was experiencing these spiritual phenomena. To the degree that he fulfilled 
these four conditions, to the degree that he had achieved perfection in these four states, that was the exact same degree of attachment that he achieved either, either to spiritual beings, and therefore he experienced Ruach HaKodesh, or to the Shechina, and therefore he experienced Nevoah. Now, <clears throat> these four states or four conditions which I presented, I have presented them, them intensively for four reasons. First, they describe the essential parameters and areas of the task or the avoid of a Jew. This really is the succinct summary of what the task of a Jew is to achieve these four states. Namely, the precious state or the disattachment state from Geshem, the Tahara state or the purity state, uh, the removal, in other words, of Tumor, the spiritual entity of Tumor, the Nikiu state, the state whereby an individual removed tainting of his spiritual soul, namely he removed himself from sin, and the last state, of course, was the Kedusha state, whereby he imbued himself with a far greater degree of holiness, thereby making great levels of prophecy or Ruch HaKodesh possible. <clears throat> In other words, these four states or conditions, uh, they describe the essential characteristics and the areas of the actual task of the Jew. Now the second reason why I dealt intensively with these four conditions is that they constitute the essential elements or components in the program for developing true spiritual advancement and greatness. If a person actually achieves or endeavors to realize the fulfillment, fulfillment of these four states, then this actually will yield tremendous spiritual advancement and greatness. If not, then proportionately his spiritual advancement and greatness will be diminished. Now, the third reason why I dealt intensively with this, uh, these four conditions is that they are necessary conditions that must be met for the attainment of the spiritual phenomena of Ruach HaKadosh. In other words, and Nevoah. In other words, that since we are studying the spiritual phenomena of Ruach HaKadosh and Nevoah, which of course is the outcome of the meditative process the meditative technique on Hashem, then we, of course, must know some of the conditions that a person has to achieve in order to receive uh, Ruch Kodesh or Nevoah. That is also why I dealt intensively with these four conditions, because they are the necessary conditions that must be fulfilled in order for one to realize the spiritual phenomena of either Ruch Kodesh or Nevoah. The fourth reason why I dealt with these areas, or rather these conditions, or four states intensively, is that they are also necessary to be satisfied if one wants to engage in those spiritual phenomena that can be achieved even today. And we will see that there are spiritual phenomena that can be achieved today. That what was true of yesterday, even though it cannot be realized today, however, there are many spiritual states, various spiritual phenomena that a person can achieve if he adheres to these four conditions. So, even in practical terms, these four conditions are extremely important, certainly if one wants to really become a spiritual person. In other words, even though we have lost, basically, the ability to receive Ruach HaKodesh and Nevoah in today's times, but as I said, these four conditions are crucial in realizing great spiritual states, great spiritual advancement, and of course, certain various spiritual phenomena that can be achieved even today. And I will speak about these, uh, these current spiritual phenomena uh, at a later time. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I would like to mention two famous incidents that illustrate the phenomena of Ruach HaKodesh to show you that Ruach HaKodesh was rather prevalent in the times that the Gemara was written, and that they engaged in it uh, in, 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 uh, rather frequently. Now, the first incident we find in the section of the Avoida by Yom Kippur, and it is in the section called Eila Eskra, and it says the following. 
Viti Rabbi Yishmuel Atzmoy. Rabbi Yishmuel, who was Rabbi Yishmuel Koengoro, he was a high priest, he went to ascertain from heaven if the decree which dictated the death of ten great men of Israel, if this, if this decree was revocable or not. Hadrian, the emperor of Rome, had decreed death for basically <coughs> ten tzaddikim. And these righteous people were among the greatest righteous people that were ever assembled in one generation. Among them was Rabbi Akiva, we had Rabbi Hanino ben Trajoin, we had Rabbi Shimmi Gamliel, we had Rabbi Shmuel, and so on. In any case, the incident goes as follows. Viti Rabbi Shmuel Atzmoy, and Rabbi Shmuel purified himself. We see there the state of Tahara, because Tahara, or a state of purity, was necessary to achieve Ruch HaKodesh. In any case, he purified himself. Behiskir Hashem, and he mentioned the Shem. He pronounced, or he meditated, on the sound of a Shem. And this is one of the ways, of course, of meditating. That he intensely focused his awareness on the sound of a Shem. And this was the method that was prevalently used at the time of the Gemara. In any case, we all, uh, we his Hashem, he pronounced, he meditated on the sound of the Shem, besiludim, with great awe. We all morum, and he ascended on high. Not that he really left his body, but it looked as if he ascended. Then it says, Vishual me ish ho ish, me eis ho ish levusha badam. He asked from a man that was clothed in white lim, linen, and he asked him, Is this decree revocable or not? And Vnom Loi, he answered him, Kablu alechem tzaddikim vididim. You, have, you must accept upon yourselves, O righteous people and dear friends, Kishumati miachiri hapargoi, that I have heard from behind the partition or the wall, Kibazois atem kodim, that you have been seized in this matter. In other words, he told them that this decree is irrevocable. So we see that he actually perceived spiritual beings that was symbolized by a man dressed in <clears throat> white linen, and he actually communicated with him. In any case, that individual who was a malach told him that I have heard in the upper worlds that the decree is irrevocable. <clears throat> Yorad Vihigid, he went down and he told Lachaver of Mama Kale. He told his friends, of course, the statements of God that this decree was irrevocable. This is what he told them. Now this is really Ruach HaKodesh. He actually experienced Ruach HaKodesh. In any case, this section is an Eile Eskara, which is recited on Yom Kippur by the Avoid of the service of Yom Kippur. This section, in any way, or this incident, reveals what we've been studying. What Ruach HaKodesh is, how does one achieve it, and some of the interesting uh, facets of the experience of Ruach HaKodesh. There is a second incident which I want to disclose, and that is also the phenomenon of Ruach Kodesh, and that is the, the incident of Pardes. And the Gemon Chagigo says that Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, ben Azai, ben Zoymo, and Acher, who was Elisha ben Avuyo, all four entered Pardes. And Pardes is the Kabbalistic or mystical term when somebody uh, ascends or achieves Ruach HaKodesh and he ascends into Olam Yitzira, that is the term used, it's called Pardes. In any case, they ascended into Pardes, Pardes means the grove, the orchard. They ascended into the orchard to receive astounding knowledge and enlightenments and they did it with the Haskaras Shem they again pronounced a name of God. And Rashi and Teisvis in Chagigo say this. Again, that is Ruach HaKodesh. They meditated on a Shem, they pronounced the Shem, they focused awareness on the sound of the Shem, and they were able to elevate themselves or ascend into Olim Yitzira, or they were able to experience the phenomenon of, of, of Ruach HaKodesh. Now, interestingly enough, <coughs> Rabbi Akiva entered that world, perceived it, derived whatever he derived, the mystical knowledges, and he came down in peace. He went up in peace, 
and he came down in peace. He was untouched, he was undamaged by the experience because he was ready for the experience. Benazai died. Why? Because Benazai could not stand the gilu, the revelation of the unity of God. He died from dvekus. He died from absolute love and yearning from God. He just didn't want to return, so he died. Ben Zoma went mad because obviously it was too much and he wasn't prepared for such a revelation because it needs immense amount of labors and efforts to prepare yourself. He wasn't ready, so he went mad. He became psychotic, unfortunately. And the fourth individual, Elisha ben Abuya, became a min, became an apostate. He became irreligious, an atheist. And therefore he is called Acher, the other. That is the incident that I wanted to mention from Paradise. In any case, so we see that these two incidents reveal or they illustrate uh, the methods of Ruach HaKodesh that it was, uh, it was realized by the pronouncing of Hashem. In this case, they pronounced it rather than visualized it or looked at it. Because the, the, the derech of Tanoim to achieve Ruach HaKodesh was primarily through sound, to meditate on a sound. That was basically their way. And uh, that is the way that they used, they employed that way in order to achieve a spiritual elevation, which of course is Ruach HaKodesh. Anyway, these are two famous incidents which illustrate <clears throat> the phenomena of Ruach HaKodesh and how it occurs. So far, what we have covered, therefore, therefore are the conditions for Ruach HaKodesh and Nevoa, or prophecy. And also, I had mentioned uh, the ideas of uh, some of the incidents that illustrate uh, these phenomena. So far, we have discussed the following areas. And I just want to uh, attempt a, a, a short, quick review before we proceed into the next area. What have we seen so far? What are the areas that we've discussed so far? Well, first we went to the, the concept of the procedure. And we saw that the procedure was the technique of meditation upon a particular Shem. In other words, meditation upon a particular Shemus, this constituted procedure for achieving the outcome, certain spiritual outcomes. And what was meditation? Meditation was the, uh, the uh, idea of super-focused awareness without any sen uh, sensations or extraneous mental input. And uh, this meditation took place upon particular shamus, and this was the object of meditation. That was the procedure which we had discussed. The next area was the, in the immediate effects <coughs> of the procedure itself. And we saw what that was, is that the Rabbanu Shalom is mashpia ahashpo, which means that God causes a hashpo, and hashpo we saw is a causative entity, it's a force, which actually can cause or bring into being. In other words, the, Rab the Rabbanu Shalom is mashpia, he influences or he causes to be a hashpo, an entity itself that can cause. And this causative entity or force, this is designated by the particular Shem which the individual medita meditated upon. That was the immediate effect or the immediate result of the procedure. Then we went into the area of the outcomes of the procedure. And we saw so far that there are two outcomes. One is the phenomena of Ruach HaKodesh. This is a sp spiritual phenomena and we had seen that it has four aspects. The first aspect is that there is a, a, a uh, phenomena called attachment, whereby the self or the nefesh of a person is attached to a spiritual being. The second aspect of Ruach HaKodesh was the fact that as a result of this attachment, this individual experiences that attachment and he knows that he's attached to a spiritual being. And as a result of the attachment, the second aspect is that he receives divine enlightenment, or rather in, uh, divine enlightenment and knowledge. 
he receives hasogas, which are ruchni, spiritual in nature. And uh, these hasogas, of course, are a result of the fact that he's attached to this spiritual being. That was the second aspect of Ruach HaKodesh. The third aspect of Ruach HaKodesh, which we had seen, was the idea that a person who was experiencing the state of Ruach HaKodesh perceived spiritual beings in, on, on certain existential planes. And the fourth aspect was the fact that the individual sometimes communicated with these spiritual being, beings. And I had mentioned two famous incidents of Ruach HaKodesh. One was the Tihe Rabbi Yishmuel Atzmai, that Rabbi Yishmuel, of course, ascended on high to find out if the decree against the ten martyrs was irrevocable, and he found out that it was. But he did so on the basis of meditating on Hashem, and he ascended on high to perceive or the, the, uh, the permanence of the decree. In any case, that was one incident. And the second incident I had mentioned was the incident of Pardes, where Fort Tanoim had entered Pardes <clears throat> to, uh, to uh, be privy to divine enlightenments and knowledge. And uh, this, of course, was the phenomenon of Ruch Kodesh. Now, the second outcome is called the spiritual phenomenon of Navu or prophecy. And I had mentioned that this has five aspects. The first aspect, which is the essence of prophecy, is the attachment that the self of the Nefesh el has with God himself. This is a state of Dvekas, the greatest spiritual phenomenon a person can ever achieve. Uh, this was the first aspect of Navuo prophecy. The second aspect of Navuo prophecy was the fact that this individual also received incredible enlightenments or knowledge, concepts, or Hasogus. <clears throat> and uh, this was the second aspect of, aspect of Nevoah. The third aspect of Nevoah is that the individual perceived uh, spiritual images which represented the divine uh, Shechina itself, or the COVID, the glory of God. The fourth aspect of Nevoah was the fact that the individual at times communicated with the Shechina. And the fifth aspect of Nevoah and it is the most um, insignificant aspect in the sense that it was not necessary to, at all for prophecy, and it really occurred, was the fact that the prophet was sometimes requested to, make, to go on a mission to reveal that prophecy which was given to him by the Rabbani Shlalom. These are the five aspects of the spiritual phenomena called Nevoah. Then I went into the conditions in order to achieve the phenomena of Ruch HaKodesh and the phenomena of prophecy. And we saw that there were four conditions. Uh, part of, uh, sometimes they were prerequisite conditions or sometimes they were procedural conditions. In any case, we saw that the conditions were one of four states. These were the four conditional states that a person had to achieve before he would attain the phenomena of Ruch HaKodesh and Avur. The first state was called the precious state, which is the disattachment state from Geshem, materialism or physicality. The second state was called uh, the Tahara state or the purity state, where a person had to remove himself from the tumor entity, which he could contract by various different means. This was the Tara state. The third conditional state was the Niki state, where a person had to remove himself from Chet, Sin as a prerequisite to the f fulfillment of the, uh, uh, the uh, phenomena of Ruch Chodesh on And the fourth state was called the Kedusha state, where an individual had to engage in Torah, learning Torah, that is, doing or performing mitzvahs, asay and loisa say, positive commandments and negative commandments, and to acquire good character traits or midos, toivos. This is what we had gone into so far. Now, <clears throat> what we saw is that these, what we see therefore is that these are the four elements in the sequence in achieving the spiritual experience of Ruch Kodesh and Nevoah, and we had covered them quite comprehensively. Now, we also discussed the nature of the prophetic state, which we realized we saw was a dream or a trance state. And that was a state in which the individual or the prophet 
was unconscious, and in addition, he had no sensations, either bodily or sensory, and also he had no control over these sensations. He could not activate or initiate any bodily or sensory input. In addition, a dream or trance state also meant that the mental activities also ceased. There was a loss of control of mental activities, which is, uh, of course, either thoughts, images, or feelings. And also, in the dream or trance state, there were images and visions in which this individual was compelled to focus his awareness in a very heightened way. And of course, these images or visions were part of the mental faculty of the imagination. And this formed the vehicle or the conveyor or the expressive device for divine revelation. We had discussed this previously. In addition, what we had discussed, and that's really where we're up to, is the sequence of the transmission of the divine revelation from above to the recipient below. That is sort of like a short synopsis of what we had covered so far in our journey to understanding the uh, outcome of Ruch HaKodesh and Nevoa. We are now up to discussing the actual image or the vision that the Prophet saw. Now, we now will discuss the image or the vision which really was initiated or induced by the divine revelation that takes place in the imagination of the Novi. Now, what did the Novi really perceive? What did he see? Well, what the Novi perceived in his imagination, because remember that was the vehicle, that was the expressive device for the uh, revelation. What the Novi perceived in his imagination was truly a revelation of the divine itself. The Shechina or the covet of God. The divine presence or the glory of God. That's what he saw. He actually saw the presence, the image of God, as it can be manifested to a Nivra, to a created entity. This means and here we begin to look at it much more profoundly. This means that the Novi, the Prophet, could see into Oilam Atsilus, the world of emanations. This is the universe of the world that has the, that, or, or the, the world of the universe or the, the existential plane or the ontological dimension of the spheres themselves. In other words, the divine emanations. That is the Oilam Atsilus. In other words, when we say that a person is able to look at the Shekhinah in the prophetic state, what that really means to say is that he is looking or he is perceiving the highest existential state that was ever created, namely Ulam Silas. That's what he's looking at. He actually has transcended his physical body and journeyed or actually gone up into Ulam Silas. And he actually perceives Oilam Atzilus. Now, it is very hard for us, for us to understand the significance of that statement. But that is an enormous spiritual experience. The greatest spiritual experience that can ever be achieved by an individual. He saw the contents of what actually lay in Oilam Atzilus. And what lay in Oilam Atzilus? The spheres, the emanations, which is the manifestation of God as he appears to his created entities. He saw the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, or he saw the glory of God itself. So that's what we mean by the fact that he looked into Oilam Atzilus. That's how high, that's how lofty and elevated was his perception and his spiritual experience. Thus, Navua or prophecy, is when one perceives the Rabbeinu Shalom, or God, via his closest manifestation to Nevroim or created entities, namely the ten spheres of God. All Nevi'im, there is no exception, perceived Oilam Atzilus, because that is what prophecy is. If you did not perceive Oilam Atzilus, you are not having a prophetic experience. Perhaps you are having a spiritual experience, but not prophecy. 
All Nevi'im, therefore, perceived, as I said, Olam Atzilus, the divine world of the world of emanations, the highest existential state that exists. All Nevi'im, all prophets, perceived the Shekhinah or the covert of God itself. Because that's really what it means. To perceive the Shekhinah is to perceive Olam Atzilus. Now, if not, then that person was having a spiritual experience, not a prophetic, uh, prophetic experience. If he was not perceiving the Shekhinah, then he was not having a prophetic experience. He was having what's called a spiritual experience, which is vastly different. And it's very important to point this out. That's what Nevoah is. And many people don't understand that. They think any spiritual experience is a prophetic state. It is not so. Prophecy is the attachment an individual has toward God himself and the ability to perceive the divine presence or the glory of God itself, the spheres. And of course, those are all in the Ulam Atzilis or the world of emanations or the world of nearness. It's another word for it. Thus, Ruach HaKodesh is a true lofty spiritual experience, but it is not a prophetic experience. Again, Prophecy, therefore, is experiencing a revelation of God Himself, not merely another spiritual being, no matter how great, lofty, or elevated that being is. That's what prophecy is. This is the essence of prophecy. If the individual experienced the image of God or a vision of God, he was a prophet. If he did not, he was not a prophet. He was merely experiencing a lower spiritual a state called Ruach HaKodesh, or the divine inspiration. <clears throat> now, even though a person experienced God Himself, the Kovid or the Shekhinah of the Rabbani Shlalom, in Eilam Atzilus, we have to know an important idea. Man cannot perceive the Shekhinah or Kovid of God directly, as one sees a person standing in front of him. Even if you can look into Olam Atzilis, you can't look at the cover, the glory of God, His divine presence, or spheres directly, like I am looking at you while I am saying the shir. The revelation of God to the Novi can only come about through intermediaries. In other words, there must be intermediate conveyors, intermediate beings that convey or carry the perceptual image of the Shekhinah itself and they bring this down to the Navi that is the only way a prophet can perceive God these intermediaries that convey the divine revelation in other words they conveyed the percept the perception of the Shekhinah itself they carry this perception in whatever mystical way they did it these intermediaries that carry the divine revelation, that eventually, of course, was seen by the Novi in his imagination, faculty of his mind, while this individual was in the prophetic state or trance state. In other words, these intermediaries acted the same way that <clears throat> lens, a lens would, lenses would act on the light representing a certain image would pass through them. In other words, the intermediaries, by being an intermediary, would have the same effect on the divine image as a light would have on a light which is passing through it. And the light, of course, is carrying the image of uh, some object or whatever. And what was that effect? Just as the light of an image is refracted obscured and somewhat distorted when it passes through a lens because that's what happens when light which represents an image of an object passes through a lens there is somewhat of a refraction an obscurement some kind of distortion it's not the exact same thing that the light represents in any case just as the light of an image gets refracted and somewhat distorted when it passes through a lens so is the divine image also obscured slightly as it passes through the intermediaries that convey and transmit it. And we will understand more why this happens later because we're going to go into the 
the concept of what the Prophet really saw and how he saw it, which is not really known by many people. In any case, that's what happened to the uh, divine image. It was also obscured as it passed through the intermediaries that convey it. In other words, just as the light of an image is refracted, obscured, and sort of distorted when it passes through a lens, so is the divine image also obscured when it is, when it, as it passes through the intermediaries that convey and transmit it. Thus, the Navi does not see a crystal clear image of the Shekhinah, but rather an obscured, distorted, or refracted image of the Shekhinah. Very important to know. This is called the concept of the Aspaklaria. Aspaklaria in English means a lens. Some people translate it as a mirror, but lens is probably more accurate in terms of this concept. The concept of Aspaklaria meant, or the concept of the lens meant, that the image or the divine image that was transmitted or conveyed to a prophet did not go directly to the prophet, but it had to go through means or intermediaries. And these intermediaries acted the same way a lens does in terms of refracting the light. These intermediaries also somewhat obscured the image or the vision of God himself. Now, in addition, Besides the concept of aspaklaria, or the concept of intermediaries, or metaphorically lenses, which would obscure the image of God, in addition, there could be one or many intermediaries carrying or transmitting the divine image that was to be revealed to a prophet. It was possible to have one intermediary, one lens, or many intermediaries, many lens, lenses that would convey the divine image. Now obviously the clarity and the precision of the divine vision or image was dependent upon the amount of intermediaries utilized to carry the vision or image. Obviously the clarity and the precision of the image was dependent on the amount of intermediary or lenses through which the divine image had to pass through on its way down to the prophet. In other words, the more intermediaries employed, in other words, the more lenses employed metaphorically, the greater was the obscurement and distortion of the perception of the Kavli, the glory of God, or the Shekhinah, his divine presence. The fewer the intermediaries employed to transmit the perception, the divine image, the greater was the clarity of the divine revelation. So, the divine revelation, <coughs> or rather, the clarity of the divine image or vision revealed was a function of the amount of the intermediaries utilized to convey the divine image itself. That's a very important formula. And we'll see what the significance of this later on. Now again, this is similar to a lens, which is the metaphor of the intermediary, the aspaklaria. The more lenses the image light traverses, the more lenses that the light of a specific image has to traverse, the greater is the refraction and obscurement and distortion perceived by the viewer. The fewer lenses that the light of the image has to traverse, the more precise and clear is the image to the viewer. So that is the second important concept, and that is the concept of the fact that it is possible that there would be many intermediaries or lenses through which the divine image would pass. And it, this would, of course, have tremendous repercussions on the clarity of the divine image that the prophet saw. Now, the clarity and precision of the divine image or vision perceived by the prophet was not only dependent on the fact that intermediaries were employed to convey this divine image in the first place, and not only are also on the fact, in other words, that the clarity and precision of divine image or vision perceived by the prophet was not only dependent on this idea, the idea of intermediaries in the first place, and also on the fact that there could be from one to many intermediaries used 
it was not only the clarity of the image was not only dependent on these two factors, but was also dependent on the type of intermediary used. That was a, a third factor, which would uh, 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 determine the clarity of the divine image. Thus, some intermediaries dulled, they obscured and distorted the divine image much more than other intermediaries. This is true of a lens also. In other words, the way one sees a divine vision depended on the particular intermediary involved. Just as what one sees through a lens, namely the image, will also depend on the, on the particular lens employed. Some lenses dull the image far more than other lenses. In other words, some lenses possess a much greater degree of opaqueness than other lenses. And the reverse, some lenses possess a much, much greater degree of transparency than other lenses. So therefore, the clarity of the prophetic vision was dependent on two factors. How many intermediaries, or metaphorically, lenses, were employed to convey this divine vision? And number two, the type of intermediary or lens which was employed to convey the divine image. These two factors determined, the, uh, these were the factors in the clarity of the image that was perceived by the prophet. Uh, in other words, they determined the clarity of the image of the Shekhinah that was perceived by the Prophet. Now, in summary, <clears throat> then, the prophetic image or vision is not like seeing something directly. In other words, it's not like looking at the divine presence, the Shekhinah, or the COVID, the glory of God directly. Rather, it is like seeing it through a lens or aspaclaria or perhaps through a series of lenses where the image is refracted and obscured from one lens to the other lens. In other words, as the image goes down from one lens to the other lens, and so on down to the Novi, the prophet, who perceived this divine vision. Besides this, the prophetic vision is not seen as if it was transmitted through a lens, or rather a clear and polished lens, but rather through a dull lens. It is thus even more difficult to see the divine image clearly. This was the second impediment to clarity. So, the first impediment to clarity was the concept, of course, of the amount of lenses or intermediaries that carry the divine image. The second impediment to clarity of the divine image or vision was the type of intermediaries employed uh, to convey the divine image or to convey the uh, divine revelation itself. Now, this is the ideas of the aspaclaria. In other words, we see that the divine image actually very, uh, was variable there was a perceptual variation of the divine image to the prophet. That's the important idea. Not all prophets saw the same thing. They all saw the Shekhinah, that they all saw, but the degree of clarity was very different for, for different prophets because the intermediaries produced a variation in the perception of the image or vision that the prophet saw. That's a very important idea in prophecy. And this is the concept of the Aspaclaria. Now, what I just wanted to mention is the idea that the amount of intermediaries uh, that a person would have, and also the type of intermediaries that a person would have, and of course we know that these were the factors which established the amount of clarity a person would have of the divine image, these, to a great extent, were dependent on the acts of the prophet. To what extent did he fulfill the conditions of prophecy? The, the, uh, the uh, precious state, the Tahara state, the Nikiu state, and the Kedusha state. And in many ways, this would determine exactly 
what intermediaries this person would have concerning his prophecy if he had achieved great success in these conditions and assuming he was doing the procedure correctly then he would have he would have far less intermediaries and the intermediaries that he would have would be of course would be of a superior type they would let the clarity in, they would uh, they would allow greater clarity in the divine image if he had done this then he would have obviously a far greater perception of the divine and if not if he did not fulfill these conditions in an adequate way or in an inferior way, then his prophecy, his prophetic image, would also be inferior in terms of the fact that he would perceive it uh, in an unclear, vague manner. And this really, uh, so, the, so therefore the rule or principle which determined the clarity of perception, which of course was caused by the amount and type of intermediaries, was really determined by this person's acts in achieving the prerequisite conditions and the procedural conditions that were necessary for the attainment of prophecy. It is important to remember that despite these obscurements and distortions of the image, the divine image or vision, which of course was brought about by the employment of intermediaries in the first place, and also various amounts of these intermediaries, and also specific types of these intermediaries, it is important to remember that despite these obscurements, despite all this, what the Navi actually saw was the Shechina, was the divine presence itself, or the glory of God itself, and not something else. He did not see another spiritual being. This is what he saw, despite the fact that there was obscurements in that vision. In other words, although the divine presence was not seen directly, what was seen through these intermediaries or lenses was the object itself together with, with all its motions. The Novi had no doubt whatsoever as to the vision or image being of the Shekhinah itself. He had no doubt. In other words, even though he saw that image in an obscure fashion, it was sort of like, you know, vague, shimmering or whatever, however he saw it, he had no doubt that the image itself was of God, because that was part of the prophecy, that the image is of God himself, and he knew this. This was all part of the prophecy. <clears throat> now, as a result of the phenomena of intermediaries, and also of the concept that there are differing amounts of them, and also the concept that there are different types of these intermediary as a result of these this ph these phenomena of intermediaries existing there exists also many variations or degrees of clarity of the divine or prophetic vision to the prophet in other words we see that the intermediaries are really factors or determinants of the variation or degree of the prophetic clarity or the perceptual clarity of the divine image. Each degree of perception of the divine image signified a different level of prophetic attainment. This gives rise, therefore, to the phenomena of many different levels and degrees of prophecy also being present. In other words, what we see is that since we have the idea of intermediaries or the phenomena of, of, of obscurement, this obviously meant that there were various different levels of perception of the divine image. Each different level of perception was in reality a different prophetic state or a different level of prophetic attainment. Therefore we see that prophecy or the levels of prophecy were many depending on the level of perception. So therefore, the level of perception or the level of clarity of the divine vision is equal to the prophetic state. The greater the clarity, the higher the prophetic state. So we see that there are many levels of prophecy that existed. Since there were many different degrees of clarity that existed as a result of the phenomena of intermediaries. 
Thus, one prophet may see the Shekhinah through fewer intermediaries and clearer intermediaries than another prophet. His level of prophecy was therefore much higher. But in all levels of prophecy, the prophet saw the covered, the glory itself, and knew without any doubt whatsoever that it was God that was being revealed and made known to him, and that it was God that was responsible for this prophetic experience. This is what the Navi knew, in spite of the fact that he had obscurement, and it really didn't make a difference what level he was at. The idea is that he knew that the vision was from God, and that it was God that was being revealed and made known to him, and also that the Rabbi Islam was responsible for him actually undergoing this prophetic experience. Now, even though the clarity of the prophetic image varied from prophet to prophet, he always perceived the true essence of the revealed concept, ideas, and knowledge that accompanied the prophetic vision. Because a prophet would perceive not only a vision of God, but he would also understand ideas, concepts, and knowledge at the same time. The, in other words, these accompanied the vision itself. He perceived, so regarding these ideas and concepts and knowledge, the Novi or the Prophet perceived it completely. He perceived these ideas clearly and accurately, and he perceived these ideas with all its inferences and implications, and also without any doubt at all as to the veracity of the idea revealed, the information itself, and also without any doubt as to the validity of the nature of the experience he was undergoing. He knew it all. He knew the idea, the concept, or the knowledge, or the divine mystery, mystery being revealed to him. He knew it clearly and accurately. He knew it completely. In other words, he knew it, knew it with all the inferences and implications that was embedded or can be derived from the idea. And he also knew that the experience he was having was truly prophecy, and he knew that the idea itself was true. The validity of the idea itself was part of the divine revelation. There was no doubt in his mind. He knew that he was having a prophetic experience, and that these ideas were absolutely true. Nevertheless, just as the covert or the glory of God, his Shekhinah, is revealed as shown to the Navi in an obscured, refracted image, which we have seen, so also the ideas, the concept, and knowledge which accompanied these visions, which were revealed also to the Prophet, was transmitted to him garbed or clothed in allegories or metaphors. But he received not only the understand or not only the metaphor itself but he received the interpretation or the meaning or the explanation of the metaphor simultaneous to the metaphor itself. In other words, thus he received both the metaphor and the meaning of the metaphor, in other words, in other words the interpretation and explanation at the same time. And this is chidois and misholom. In other words, the Navi or the Prophet received a divine vision as part of the revelation, and also as part of the revelation was concepts, ideas, and knowledge about the divine mysteries. Just like he received the vision in an obscured fashion, he received the ideas also in an obscured fashion. But the obscured fashion of the vision, or rather of the knowledge and concepts, was the fact that this idea was clothed in a metaphor. That's how it was given to him. But the interpretation of the metaphor was also given at the same time. So one could never say to a Novi, maybe you did not understand the prophetic message or the prophetic revelation because you received it in an obscured metaphoric or, or allegorical means. The answer was not, not that. That even though he received it in that fashion, the interpretation, the explanation, and the meaning of the metaphor was given at the exact same time as the metaphor. So the prophet knew exactly what it meant, but that's the way these 
mysteries were revealed. They were never revealed directly. Just as the image was not revealed directly and clearly. And just like that was obscured and distorted, so also the knowledge itself was also obscured, but in the form of an allegory or a metaphor. But at, in both ways, <clears throat> the Novi or the Prophet understood clearly the implication and significance and the meaning of the metaphor, just like he understood the implication and the meaning and the interpretation of the vision of the image of God. Now, we now come to the next area, and that is the question, what is the nature of the intermediaries mentioned previously? Because I had said that there are intermediaries that obscure the image as it comes down to the prophet. And these act as lenses. But the question then is, what is this intermediary? Or what is the nature of the lenses or the intermediaries? An intermediary of prophecy was specifically designated malochim, angels, chosen from several worlds, whether it be from Oilam Bria, the world of creation, or Oilam Yitzira, the world of formation. And the, the, uh, the, uh, these designated malochim, their task was to carry or transmit and convey the actual divine message or vision to the prophet during the prophetic experience. That was the intermediary. The intermediary were specifically designated malochim or angels whose task was to transmit and convey the divine vision to the prophet himself. They were the intermediaries. Therefore, when we say or when we refer to the idea of number of intermediaries, of course, what this means is the number of angels transmitting the prophetic vision to the prophet. How many were there in between the uh, divine image and in between the recipient, namely the prophet? And when we refer to the type of intermediaries employed, what this refers to, this indicates the oilom or the existential plane that these angels reside in. That's what it means by type of intermediary. And I will explain further. A Novi, as stated previously, could see in Toilum Atsilus. Now, what I'm about to say is not known by most people because it is the understanding of prophecy via what truly transpired in terms of the Oilomas. In any case, a Novi, as stated previously, could see in Toilum Atsilus, into the existential plane Whereby, where the spheres or the Shekhinah or the covet of God was. But he could only see into the Oilam Atsilis via Oilam Bria. He could not look into Atsilis standing in Atsilis. He could look into Atsilis via the Oilam of Bria. So therefore Bria was the lens that he would look through to see the image or vision in Oilam Atsilus. In other words, angels from Oilam Bria, from the world of creation, would act as the prophetic intermediaries, and by doing so, would automatically obscure the divine image, because there is the existential state, which was Oilam Bria, which was, of course, less than Oilam Atsilus, would diminish the image that originated from Oil Matzilus. That is the understanding of what the intermediaries are. The angels in Oil Bria served as the conveyors or transmitters, transmitters of the image that originated from Oil Matzilus because it was the image of the Shekhinah or the covered or the spheres itself. They obscured that image. In other words, the prophet could look into Oil Matzilus through Oil Bria because the intermediaries were the angels of Oilumbria that conveyed that image. And because these angels existed on a lower plane, the image itself would be perceived in a lower existential form. And that automatically is an obscurement. Now, the more Malachim employed, 
the more angels employed or intermediaries employed in Olim Bria, the greater the obscurement and the distortion of the prophetic image to the Navi. <coughs> Obviously, the more <coughs> uh, uh, angels employed, Obviously, the image itself would suffer as a result of having to be conveyed through so many different intermediaries or so many different malochim. In other words, obviously, the more lenses employed to view the image in, obviously then, the greater is the distortion and obscurement. Thus, all prophets, without any exception, could see all the way up to Olam Silus, which is an incredible perception that we have no anung in Yiddish, we have no hasoga, we have, it is incomprehensible what they could see, because Olam Silus is the highest existential plane in Olam Hazer. But every prophet could see into Olam Silus. that's what he saw, the divine image or vision. God or the covered himself, but only through the lenses of Olam Bria, only through the intermediaries, the angels of Olam Bria. In other words, the Uris, the lights, or the, the enlightenment, that reality of Atsilus, and that's what Uris means, the reality of Atsilus, was closed completely in the garment of Olam Bria. That's another way of saying it. It's a more Kabbalistic statement. The iris of Olam Atsilus, that perception in Olam Atsilus, the perception of God, his covered, was clothed in the garment of Olam Bria. So in order to see Olam Atsilus, you had to look via the lens of Olam Bria. And depending on the amount of lenses or intermediaries or malochum of Olam Bria, that of course established the amount of clarity that a person would have concerning the divine image which originated from Olam Atzilus. Now, <clears throat> Moshe Rabbeinu's prophetic vision, however, was much greater and more elevated than all other prophets combined. We now know what the prophetic image was, <clears throat> and that it came from Olam Atzilus, and we understand what the obscurement phenomena was, and this was angels or intermediaries in Olam Bria. What, however, was the difference between Moshe Rabbeinu's prophetic insight or vision and all other prophets? Because we know that the perception that Moshe Rabbeinu had was far greater than the greatest prophet, as the Torah itself testifies. Lekombi Yisrael Novi Kamosha, that or, or there, there will never arise and never has arisen a prophet in Israel like Moshe Rabbeinu, which means that there is no such thing as a prophet other than Moshe Rabbeinu that has had that prophetic vision or that clarity that Moshe Rabbeinu had. So the question then is, what kind of clarity did he have? Now that we understand the mechanism of the obscurement, then what did he see, the Olam Silas? And now we can really understand in a beautifully precise way the difference between the vision of Moshe Rabbeinu and the vision of all other prophets. Now, <clears throat> while all other prophets could see the divine image, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, or the covet of God, the glory of God, or as I said before, the Uris, the lights or the reality of Olam Atzilus, only through many malochim or intermediaries of Olam Bria, he, Moshe Rabbeinu, saw the awe of Olam Atzilus. He saw the Shekhinah or the glory of God through only one single intermediary or malach of Olam Bria. Only one. Thus he saw the awe through a single, highly polished lens. The clarity that he achieved was therefore incredible to behold. He was a man that was looking into Olam Atzilus, and the only thing separating him from Olam Atzilus was one malach, or one conveyor of the prophetic vision. 
Therefore, he saw Olam Atzilus through Bria, but there was only one lens or one intermediary that stood in his way. <coughs> so obviously the image was uh, uh, of a superlative clarity. Not only was the image incredibly beautiful to behold because he saw the greatest a man could perceive the image of God, and I cannot convey what, what even that begins to mean, but even the concepts and the ideas and the knowledge which accompanied the divine vision was also given in a clear, direct manner without the use of any metaphors or allegories to clothe the ideas or concepts. Because the idea is that the concepts and knowledge that the prophet perceived, uh, the way it was garbed was exactly the same amount as the way he perceived the vision. If he perceived the vision clearer, then the allegory or metaphor that clothed the idea was also clearer. If he s perceived it less clearly, more obscure, then the metaphor was more obscure or was a, a more involved metaphor. Therefore, by Moshe Rabbeinu, since he saw Oilam Atzilus, the awe or the divine image of Oilam Atzilus, through a single highly polished lens, which metaphorically means, of course, through one intermediary in Oilam Bria, he perceived ideas, knowledge, and concepts also without any misholem, without any metaphoric guise or allegorical guise. He perceived it clearly and directly as if I tell you an idea without having to uh, command to, without having to refer to an allegory or a metaphor. Thus, he could om he almost, or rather, he could almost see into Oile Matzilus, standing in Oile Matzilus itself. Thus, not only did he perceive Oile Matzilus, which is the glory of God, the spheres, as all other prophets did, because they also perceived Oile Matzilus, but he perceived it with the greatest possible clarity that a living human being can ever attain. He could look into Oile Matzilus standing almost at the boundary between Oil Matzilus and Oil Bria. He was that close. He could almost touch it. He was right up against Oil Matzilus. So even though he also had to go through Oil Bria, but the veil was very thin. All of the prophets could see the divine vision in Oil Matzilus only through most of Oil Bria. In other words, all the other prophets could see the vision in Oil Matzilus, or the awe of Oil Matzilus, through many, many, many different intermediaries of Oil and Bria. So when they saw Oil Matzilus, they saw it through the entire Oil and Bria. In other words, they must have seen it through maybe 10 lenses before they saw, they saw the image through 10 lenses. <clears throat> you know what it's like? It's like looking at a object at the bottom of a hundred foot lake. And uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to see the object almost as if he was in the lake maybe three feet away. Everybody else could see it while they were in the ship looking down. So they had to look through the air and into the water also. He perceived the ore of Oil Matzilus in a very thinly clothed or, or, or very thinly veiled in the garment of Oil and Bria. <coughs> but you should know, even in the case of Moshe Rabbeinu, the covet or the glory of God can only be revealed to the extent that he was able to accept it. Even he could not look at the face of God directly. He could not look into Oil Matzilus through Oil Matzilus. Even he could not see the glory directly, but only as an image formed through a lens or through a mirror. The image that he saw was one that was complete and clear, just like an image seen through a brilliantly clear lens that is extremely polished, without a trace of any dullness. No other prophet 
ever achieved the mind-boggling perception of the glory of God that Moshe Rabbeinu achieved. That is the difference between the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu and others. In other words, the obscurement phenomena was minimal in the case of Moshe Rabbeinu. He also perceived the awe or the light or the reality of Ilma Tzilus, but only through one single intermediary. Therefore, his perception was enormous, just incomprehensible. All other prophets perceived the images of Ilma Matsilus through many lenses, through many intermediaries, to the extent that they would have to look through the entire Ilm Bria to see into the image which originated from Ilm Matsilus. That is the way the other prophets saw. And what's important to understand is that the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu has such an incredible perception was not so much due to his avoido or his kedusha, which of course was enormous, but it was due to the fact that since he had to receive the Torah, which was given through prophecy, his perception had to be incredibly clear, because if not, we would receive a distorted Torah. In other words, he had to perceive and understand Torah absolutely in a clear and comprehensible manner. And this he would transmit to the Jews. That is why he was given such an incredible perception. Because it could be that there were other tzaddikim and kedushim who were in a state of readiness as great as Moshe Rabbeinu in terms of their kedusha. But they could not be privy or privileged to assume that prophetic state because they were not transmitting the Torah to Jews. Therefore, the greatest amount of, of, of a prophetic state or divine revelation that they could perceive was, of course, much less. And that's, that's something very important to, to know, that there were other prophets who probably could have perceived that kind of prophecy in terms of their kedusha or in terms of their having fulfilled the prerequisite and procedural conditions that were so necessary. But they could not experience prophecy or the divine image that way because their task was not to reveal the Torah to Klai Israel. It was really for their own spiritual growth, primarily. Therefore, they never really received uh, prophecy or the uh, perception of the divine image of God on that level. Now, this is really what the Rabbeinu Shalom told Moshe Rabbeinu when he said, Kilo yir'ani ha'odum v'chai. A man cannot see me and live. What was the Rabbanu Shem really telling Moshe Rabbeinu? Well, now we know. Because what the Rabbanu Shem was telling Moshe Rabbeinu was that to see the awe of Olam Atzilus, the world of emanations, to see the reality in the world of emanations, and actually be standing in Olam Atzilus without any intermediaries of Olam Bria, the world of creation, is not possible and it cannot be achieved by any living human being. However, in Olam Habo, it will be attained by all who will merit Olam Habo. We will be able to see Olam Atzilus in Olam Atzilus. And that is what the Olam Habo is really about. It will come via <clears throat> a direct connection between us and the Rabbanu Shalom and not via intermediaries. That's when it says, Kilo yirani odum v'chai. Man cannot see me and live, but man can see me after death. In other words, as long as you are alive, you must use the vehicle of Ilm Bria. You must use the intermediaries, or those malochim, those lenses of Ilm Bria. However, even you, Moshe Rabbeinu, that uses only one lens, one intermediary, cannot look into Ilm Atzilus from the standpoint of Oil Matzilus, you cannot enter, you are denied entrance. However, in Oil Mahabo, you will be permitted entrance, but then so are we all. And that is the nature of prophecy, or the nature of the vision or image that a person will have in Oil Mahabo. He will perceive the Yichud of God, the unity of God. And that's really, by the way, what you perceived, which I had mentioned earlier, what you perceived when you saw the Shekhinah. You saw how the entire universe emanated from the oneness of God. That's really what you saw. But in Ilm Habo, we will be able to see that. We will have the clarity 
and the vision of Oilam Atsilus, those Uris, that reality of Oilam Atsilus, and we will perceive it as if we were standing in Oilam Atsilus itself. And it won't go through any intermediaries. That, and that in any case is what the Rabbanisha means by that Pasuk. Kilo yirani ha'odum v'chai, man cannot see me, means you cannot look at the Shechino or the Kovoid or the Spheres in the Olam Atzilus itself and live. This can only happen after a person dies. <coughs> now, thus Moshe Rabbeinu differed from all other Nevi'im in terms of several factors, <coughs> and I will go through them. The first idea is that he differed from all other prophets in the clarity of his prophetic image or his prophetic vision. That was the first major difference between he and all other prophets. The second major difference between he and all, his prof- and all the other prophets is that <clears throat> all ideas, concepts, and knowledge which was revealed to him was presented in a clear, direct manner without the use of any metaphors or allegories. It was presented exactly, precisely, clearly, and directly. That was a second major distinction that he possessed, which was different between him and all other prophets. Now, besides these two distinctions mentioned, he differed from all other prophets in three other ways. Therefore, I'm mentioning five ways in which he differs. i would mentioned two, namely the clarity of the image, and the second was in the fact that the ideas, concepts, concepts, and knowledge were revealed directly and not through the avenue of metaphors or allegories. Now, I will now discuss three other ways. And that will complete the idea in terms of what I want to present of the difference between the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu and other prophets. He could also <coughs> receive a divine revelation or prophecy while he was wide awake and in a normal state of consciousness. Thus, he did not have to lose consciousness and enter into a dream or trance state like other prophets. He didn't have to become unconscious and enter that trance state. Instead, he could experience prophecy while he was wide awake and he was in a normal state of consciousness. He didn't have to enter a dream state, which was what? Whereby he would experience a total absence of all sensory and bodily sensations, and also a total absence of any extraneous mental input, namely thoughts, images, or feelings. And also, he would experience losing control over activating these sensations and extraneous mental input. He didn't go through that kind of experience. (coughs) Thus, he received his prophetic revelation while he was wide awake and in full control over all his mental faculties at all times. In other words, he had control over all his thoughts, images, or feelings, sensory input, and bodily sensations at the same time that he was receiving the highest prophetic image possible for a living human being to perceive. That was an another, another incredible difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and all other prophets. A fourth distinction between Moshe Rabbeinu and all other prophets is that, <clears throat> that all other prophets could not voluntarily initiate a prophetic vision even if they engaged in the meditative procedure that would attain a prophetic experience. In other words, all other prophets could not initiate or activate the prophetic vision, the descent of a prophetic vision, just because they engaged on a meditative procedure. It was up to the Rav Shalom if he would want to engage the prophet in a prophetic experience. They could only receive a prophetic vision when the Rabbani Shalom, when God willed to be Mashpia, the Shekhinah, or the Divine Presence, to become attached to them. Moshe Rabbeinu, on the other hand, could initiate a, prevel- a prophetic revelation whenever he wanted to. <clears throat> he was given the ability to bind or attach himself to God whenever he desired it, and thus experience a divine revelation. It was up to him. If he wanted a divine revelation now, he just went into a prophetic state, and there it was, the highest prophetic vision possible. 
a view of Olam Atzilus with only one single intermediary. Could you imagine that? Initiating that whenever you want? And not only do you get a prophetic experience, but you shoot straight to the top with that kind of a clarity. It's very difficult to comprehend Moshe Rabbeinu as a human being. Now, the last difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and all the other prophets is perhaps the greatest of all. And what was that difference? I find it to be the greatest of all. And that is that there was a third fundamental difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and all other prophets. And this lay in the fact that the revelation of all other prophets was limited only to those particular mysteries, concepts, and knowledge that the Rabbeinu Shalom, that God desired to disclose to them. Moshe Rabbeinu, however, on the other hand, had all the systems, all mysteries, all the principles, in short, all aspects of the design of creation revealed to him. He was given the permission and the authority to investigate, to delve into all things and search out the hidden panemius, aspects of all creation. All the keys to all the chambers in all the worlds <coughs> were given to him to use at his desire. He thus was privileged to achieve what no other human being ever has or ever will achieve in Ulam Haseh. Again, to recapitulate the five differences. <coughs> that the clarity that he had of a prophetic vision was totally different than other prophets. He perceived Ulam Atzilus via a single polished lens, via one intermediary or one malach in Ulam Bria, whereas all other prophets perceived it through many, many, many different intermediaries in the embryo. So the clarity was different. The second distinction is that the concepts, knowledge, and ideas that were revealed to him were revealed clearly and directly without using a metaphor or an allegory as a garb or as a medium for expression. A third distinction between Moshe Rabbeinu and all other prophets is that he did not have to enter a trans state which is a compelled meditative state, if you recall what I had said about a dream or trance state. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to lose consciousness like all other prophets had to. But he could experience the highest prophetic revelation fully awake in a normal state of consciousness. The fourth difference or distinction between he and other prophets is that he could initiate the highest prophetic experience at will voluntarily, whenever he wanted, the Rabbani Shalom would accommodate him and begin the process of divine revelation and communicate with him. All other prophets, of course, had to go through all the procedures and the conditions in order to achieve this state. And then the Rabbani Shalom had to mashpia uh, shechina. It was still up to the Rabbani Shalom if he would want to reveal a divine image. But Moshe Rabbeinu, whenever he wanted, he just entered the highest prophetic state. And the last distinction between Moshe Rabbeinu and the other prophets which I want to talk about is, in my mind, the greatest of all. That Moshe Rabbeinu could perceive all creation clearly to its most divine mysteries. Nothing was withheld from him. He was given permission or authority to go anywhere he wants. Anywhere in Oilem Atzilus or Oilem Bria, Yitzir Asir, to figure out what creation is all about. Not like other prophets that had to wait or the parameters of their prophetic experience, of course, was based on what the Rabbani Shalom wanted to reveal to them, not what they would have liked to have known. That is the fifth distinction between Moshe Rabbeinu and all the other prophets. Now, let us continue. Even after the Chorben Bayes Rishon, even after the destruction of the first temple, or rather, after the Chorben Bayes Rishon, the destruction of the first temple, even though the phenomenon of prophecy still existed, and it did, it existed until uh, some, uh, a, a short time after the destruction of the uh, first base Amigdash, prophecy still existed. Even though the phenomenon of prophecy still existed after the destruction of the first temple, the vision or covered or Shechina became more obscured and distorted. In other words, 
prophecy began changing in the sense that the prophet no more could look at God the way he used to. We now begin to see the progression of the prophetic experience or the deterioration of the prophetic experience. And let us see how that is in terms of the actual underlying structure of prophecy. So, after the Chorb Mayasvishon, even though the phenomenon of prophecy still existed, the Shekhinah or the COVID now began to become more obscured, and there was nothing the Prophet could do about that. <clears throat> what does that mean? The greater obscurement in the perception of the divine image reflected the distancing of the Shekhinah from man as a result of the Chorb Mayasvishon, as a result of the destruction of the first temple. Because what did that mean? That meant that the Shekhinah, or the Divine Presence, left man, or was ascending, because we lost the residence or the abode of God. God was now pulling up His Divine Presence. That also affected, affected the quality or the prophetic experience itself. The distancing of the Shekhinah affected itself or made itself felt to the Prophet while he was trying to achieve a perception of the divine image. Thus, Yechezkel, Hanavi, the prophet Ezekiel, Yechezkel, who prophesied after the Chorb Maestrishon, after the destruction of the first temple, could only perceive the divine presence, the Shekhinah, the glory of God, or the or the light, or the reality of Olam Silus, through the intermediaries, or the Malachim of Olam Bria, and the image or the awe being conveyed by these malachim of oil and brie itself could now itself be only perceived through the intermediaries or the malachim of oil and yitzira. Thus, the perception and clarity of the prophetic vision of oil and atzilis was diminished twofold after the destruction of the first temple. One was by the Malachim that conveyed the image or the vision through Olam Bria, and two by the Malachim that conveyed the image or vision through Olam Yitzira. So in other words, a prophet now had to go through, through two existential planes to look at God. He could still look at Olam Atzilus. He could still look at the Shekhinah or the Kovit or the glory of God. But now he had many more intermediaries that existed on two different planes. One was the intermediaries of Olam Bria. They were the intermediary or lenses through which the divine vision traversed. But now, because the Shekhinah got further, the image now had to go down through the Malachim or the intermediaries or the conveyors or the lenses of Olam Yitzira. So he now had two Olamas which he had to look through to see the image, the divine image in Olam Atzilus. Thus, the perception of a vision which originates from Olam Atzilus diminished considerably when it traverses a lower existential plane, and that's the rule. It diminishes markedly when the image goes down through a lower existential plane. And after the Chorban Bayes after the destruction of the first temple, when the Shekhinah distanced itself from man, the divine image from Olam Atzilus had to traverse two lower existential planes, Olim Brio and Olim Yitzira, on its descent to the Prophet. Thus Yechezkel could see the awe or the light or the reality of Olim Atzilus, clothed through the garment of Olim Brio, and the awe of the, or of the vision in Olim Brio itself was further clothed in the garment of Olim Yitzira. So there were now many, many leaven, levels but or intermediaries or, or, or lenses that the prophet could see the divine image. In other words, before the destruction of the first temple, a prophet could see the image of God, which originated from Olam Atzilus, via the lenses or the intermediaries or the angels of Olam Bria. So that was one type of clarity he had. After the destruction of the first temple, the prophet could only see the divine vision or image which originated from Olam Atzilus. He could now only see that first it had to traverse Olam Bria, 
the malachim or the instruments, the intermediaries or the lenses of oil and brio, and then it had to go down to the intermediary or the lenses of the malachim of oil and which is a lower existential plane than oil and brio, and then it would go down to the prophet. So Yechezkel saw oil matzilus because he was a prophet, and prophecy means you must see oil matzilus, but it was no more the same. Now he saw it in a much greater diminishment of perception and clarity than the previous prophets before him. So look at what the, the uh, destruction of the Beis HaMikdash did for prophecy. It made the perception of the divine much more difficult to perceive. And Yechezkel therefore could see Oyer Matzilus, but nowhere near the same as the earlier prophets. He could only see it now with diminishment upon diminishment. And he could just barely make out the image or the vision of God himself, which he saw, because that's what prophecy is. But it was nowhere near the clarity that the earlier prophets saw. And it's interesting to note that even though he saw the Meisimer cover, could you imagine what the earlier prophets saw? If the Meisimer cover, the incident or the event or the story of the divine chariot, the image of the divine chariot is among the greatest prophetic revelations in the entire Torah. And this was seen by Yechezkel, who only saw this via Oil and Bria, the intermediaries of Oil and Bria, and via the intermediaries of Oil and Yetzira. Could you imagine the images of the divine, uh, the divine being, God, that the earlier prophet saw or that Moshua Benu saw? No. It is not comprehensible. Because we, can, we cannot even understand what the Maisim Merkava is, barely. Let alone the images or the understandings that the earlier prophets had. And when it says that at the time of the giving of the Torah, every Jew saw more, even a maidservant saw more than Yechezkel Novi saw, and he saw the Maisim Merkava, that means they saw Atzilis through Bria, not through Yitzira. Their vision was much greater, much more clear than Yechezkel himself. So you could begin to understand what the Jews saw at the giving of, Mount, uh, of, the, giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. We can now begin to have a, an understanding of what their perception was. Because we can barely understand what Yechezkel Hanovi.